Hi, and welcome to another in my series of videos about data warehouse software and hardware integration. Um, how to architect a data warehouse from scratch um, to accommodate data warehouse specific workloads. Um, this is a continuation of my video, my previous video about indexing and indexes for a data warehouse. Um, if you have not already done so, please go back and watch the, the seri these series of videos from Data Warehouse 1 to this one um, to get a, a full and complete understanding of the concepts that I will be discussing. Um, so to begin with, as I indicated when, in my previous slide and previous presentations, that column store indexing represents, uh, column store indexes represent kind of the, um, one of the three major legs of uh, a properly built a data warehouse system and that the first being the data model uh, being star schema uh, the second being a balanced system which I've gone through in some detail hardware throughput um, megabytes per second and those kind of things and then this represents the third leg um, of, of a, con a properly constructed data warehouse system this is the column store indexes and the column store indexes are a, a major shift from um, for SQL Server, the database engine itself, in, into really optimizing uh, for data warehouse specific workloads. And so, um, and this goes all the way down to even how this data is stored. It's no longer stored in pages and extents and those kind of things in a row wise format, but it's stored in a column wise format. Um, and the major components there are segments and dictionaries. And so, this is kind of underscores the radical shift that has occurred here. Um, also, even when the data is accessed and then brought on to the CPU um, no longer uh, is it again it's been specially engineered to to work with data warehouse type workloads uh, more efficiently on the CPU in terms of its operators and all that is what is referred to as batch mode and I'll show some examples of that in a, in a little bit here so let's get going with this um, next I will go into this a little bit more. So if we have, um, here we have kind of a, a table of data. We have an ID, name, address, city, state, um, just a customer table here. And you, you probably have something very similar in your own environment. Um, it's regular tabular data with columns and rows and those kinds of things. And so I'm going to begin with traditional row storage layout and then, then use that to contrast against a uh, column store layout. So as data is going to be inserted into, new data is going to be inserted into your table here, what happens is that SQL Server, the database engine, all this data resides in, in, in pages. Uh, your table data is represented fundamentally in pages. And so as you insert more data, this data is going to reside on a new page. And it's going to keep on inserting data by rows on, on to a page until that page fills up. And then SQL Server goes ahead and creates um, another page to, to store another set of this data or another set of rows of this data until that page is filled up and the process just keeps on continuing. Um, now in terms of a hierarchy of how things are managed there are what are referred to as extents and extents are, are actually multiple pages. Um, an extent is allocated at a time um, so, so it gives you a little bit of an understanding there. There's a lot, m lot more information um, on the on the internet about extents and pages and the different kinds of pages and sgams and gams and those things that I'm not going to go into here for our purposes. I just want to really kind of underline that this is uh, these pages and extents are stored data in a row-wise format. At um, this explains why in in, in in my previous videos when I queried a table, a regular table in, in, in row storage mode, that um, even though I queried two columns um, of that from that table, all that table's data came back in terms of the number of logical reads. Well that's because even if I'm using let's say the name column, Bob, and the, um, the balance due column here, 3000, even if all I want are those two pieces of, of information, those two data points, that entire row is still going to come back. In fact, that entire page in pink here is going to be returned, even though I only requested, let's say, the name column and the uh, balance due columns here to be aggregated somehow. And that's typical of, of most data warehouse workloads. Most data warehouse workloads, we don't care about 
all the columns in our fact table for an individual query. We only want certain columns. And so uh, returning the, the entire row set here um, is, is just has, requires a lot more data to travel from disk to CPU, which increases our throughput requirement. Um, so, and, and overall will have a negative impact on the performance of our data warehouse. So that, that's rows. Now, the column store indexes as you might guess, no longer store the data in the traditional row-wise format. Now columns are store, stored in, um, in a column-wise format. And what that looks like is, so for an individual table, a table is actually broken down into its columns. Right, and these will eventually become what are known as segments here. So it's a fundamental shift in how SQL Server stores these columns. And um, each one of these columns is called a segment. And ideally, and we'll get a little bit more into this, ideally these segments exist in, in one million row kind of chunks. So the first million values in this ID column will make one segment, and the next million will make another segment. And so you have a column-wise storage in segments of your data. Uh, your name column here, it'll the first million rows will be segment one of that name column, the next million rows will be segment two of that name column, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, for your entire table, okay? So this, this, is, this is why the storage has changed dramatically. Now those are your segments. Um, so in order to compress this data, in many data warehouse scenarios, like this, this quarter column here that I have displayed, you have lots of repeating values. You know, whether or not these be product, um, product ID, and usually these repeating values, and then I'm going to re refer to specifically here, fact tables. So your fact tables will have lots of repeating values depending on what kind of columns you have in your fact table. You know, product, and your fact table should have surrogate keys, integer surrogate keys that have foreign key, or have a, a foreign key relationship, whether it's enforced or not, to your actual dimension with, with its primary key. Um, and so, but I've, I've kind of brought in these values like this just to show how things repeat. And so whether or not you have product, a customer dimension, uh, any of your date dimensions and things like that, um, all those, those surrogate keys will have uh, repeating values just like this. And, and usually fact tables have lots of repeating values. In, in other words, they have low cardinality, low number of distinct values in a column most, in most cases. And so now that things are in a row-wise format in those chunks, those segment chunks, one million row values in a single column here, you can, you can tell from this that there's, there can be a way to optimize this, right? Because you, you want to be able to compress this down. Now it's in a row-wise format, but you want to be able to compress it down fo further and actually pick out the distinct values and somehow, somehow have some kind of indicator um, that, that, that counts the distinct values and preserves this kind of format. And so what that is called is run length encoding. And what is the result of run length encoding are these things called dictionaries. Um, so for example, um, the value Q1 here, it has a starting place of the first value um, and it goes all the way, let's say, to to row or what we would used to consider row 310. So the first 310 values of this quarter column um, have the value of Q1. Okay, and then the next, uh, the Q2s begin from three row three, row number 311 to um, whatever the the next the row 311 to um, the next 290 rows will have a value of Q2. So that's how this can be condensed down or uh, into dictionaries. And the same goes for uh, this product ID. That can be condensed down into um, several dictionaries here. Here we have 
Now this is a nice example. Quarter one, you have one set of values, another set of values. But in, in product ID, you have uh, product ID. You have a, a bunch, some ones, and then some twos, and then you have ones and twos again. So you have alternating values, and this can be preserved as well in a dictionary in the same way. So you you have start with row one. It has value one all the way, and it has a count of five. So one, two. Th three, four, five there, and then you begin with your value two, and it has, um, it starts on six and has a value of three, so you have two, three, uh, you have three, two values there, one, two, three, etc. So, so you can see how in a simple situation and then in a little bit more complex uh, situation that you can now start uh, condensing down the values in this way. And I'm not going to go into a tremendous amount of detail, um, but there you will have things in your fact table. Um, and maybe not price isn't a good example, but you will have what are called degenerate facts that are, may, might be PO number or might be line order number or things like that that aren't really used for analytical purposes but are preserved at a very low level of granularity of your fact table. And those things won't condense readily down into um, one of these uh, dictionaries and so what will happen is um, the uh, the Commodore index will actually preserve these things that have a very high cardinality uh, lots of distinct values as a simple column in, a, in and of itself so that's that's kind of the basics of how this works and there there are other types of dictionaries that really keep track of this um, and um, hopefully that gives you an understanding of, of why this data compresses so much and one of the mo most important factors here and then the variable factors here is actually your data the the cardinality the number of distinct values that are in your that are in your data because depending on on the cardinality of your data uh, depends on how much compression can be um, pushed into this kind of format. Um, if it can't, if you have a high number of cardinality like the price here, um, then there's not much compression that is available and so um, so it'll take up a little bit more room and, and performance won't be as good. Um, so what I want to explore a little bit more in depth, so that's on the storage side of things. On the um, on on the CPU, once this this data in its compressed format that I just described with its segments and dictionaries uh, created, once it makes its way onto the CPU, it's actually been specially architected to to be processed faster on the CPU for a data warehouse type workload. Um, and so what I have at top, and what this is referred to is batch mode, and this is very important. I'll show this in a few minutes when I get into a little bit of demonstration. Um, that this whole thing, this whole processing of column store type th data, of column wise data, the processing of these segments and um, and dictionaries is done in a batch mode. And so uh, on the screen here, on the left hand side, I have RAM. This is system memory. This is a uh, you know your your basic uh, cache here that SQL Server will use. And um, all the way on the right, you have a CPU. Uh, a couple CPUs here. So, and one of the fundamental problems about uh, being able to have data be processed really quickly on the CPU is that RAM is much slower than than CPU. Uh, this is this RAM DDR3 is 1600 megahertz, whereas your CPU, you know, these in modern CPUs are in gigahertz, 3.2 gigahertz in this particular example. So what that means is that CPU is fundamentally going much faster than your RAM. And in, in, in order to act, I'm not going to go too much into uh, CPU architecture, but um, in order for data to make its way onto the CPU, it has to do it in steps or stages. And you have caches, you have CPU caches, and modern CPU caches have three levels. Um, and here's just some examples. Yours will not match these numbers here, but you can tell with L3 cache, it's eight, eight megabytes. And each one of these caches, as you get closer to the uh, CPU, they're smaller, but they operate much faster. 
and so they act as stepping or staging areas for data and instructions as they make their way on the CPU. L2 cache is, is much faster than L3 cache, but you can see it is also several times smaller. And then L1 is the smallest, but it is also the fastest because it's closest to the CPU. So the idea here is that batches are specifically sized, your segments and your dictionaries are specifically sized to fit either in L2 or L1 caches. Um, so when, when these things are created, SQL Server looks at the size of your L1 and L2 caches and actually uh, especially sizes them to um, to fit in this area here because this is where you'd get the best performance increase. Anytime you have to go to L3 or even worse to um, to RAM, um, you ha incur a heavy cost because your CPU cycles um, are are just wasted while that that transfer of data occurs. So. Um, and, and if you think this is all kind of something you never can see or, or really hard to, to see this kind of information, actually if you have Windows 8 and you go to Task Manager, you can actually see all this information now. So what I have pulled up here um, on my, on this particular Task Manager, this is, now this is for my laptop and so your individual um, numbers will vary is um, so I have for my CPU I have a 2.2 gigahertz CPU I have an i7 and that's the, the generation there and uh, so I have one socket four cores eight logical processors but if you look now at using Windows 8 more information is exposed to you this L1 L2 and L3 caches are now available for you to look at and your numbers will vary slightly but you can do this on your own laptop or a home PC just open up task manager in Windows 8 and there you have it um, so you can see that L3 the cache that's furthest away is the largest but it's also the slowest L2 and L1 are much much faster but they are also much slower um, so you can get a size of those an idea of relative size of everything here. And again, SQL Server can read this and make the make the segments and dictionaries and batches um, to the appropriate size. So that when we hit the CPU, they get as close to the CPU so they can be operated on by the CPU as, as quick as possible. And there's, there's uh, fewer instances of uh, CPU cycles being lost to, to waiting for data. So what this means is that even um, discounting the row-wise stor storage of this data in those segments and dictionaries, even if that were, weren't the case, the, your data would still get processed much faster because it's now in this batch mode. So, um, however, you can't use batch mode in anything but column store indexes. It's, it's all automatic functionality. So, let me show you a little bit more about what I'm talking about here. Um, So what I have here uh, is an example, and, and this is very similar to a previous example that I've used uh, in, in the past, in past videos that you can take a look at there. So, and I just want to review a, a little bit of, uh, with the column store indexes. So in SQL Server 2012, you have what's called a non-clustered column store index just as it indicates there non clustered column store index now there are two flavors of indexes there's the 2012 uh, non clustered column store index and then in 2014 which I'll get a little bit into in this video there is what's called the clustered column store index and I'm going to go through a little bit of the differences um, there's there's a good video um, uh, by Brian Mitchell uh, that that goes through these differences in more detail but I just want to cover some of the basics here that are important for our our, our discussions so as you can see um, I have a, a table here no compression uh, underscore 10 million and it's just a fact table uh, it's 10 million row fact table based on the VentureWorks data and you can see that I have in addition to the non clustered column store index I have additional indexes on here and if I 
So one of the things with a non-clustered column store index in 2012 is that you can have additional indexes on your table besides the uh, non-cluster column store. You can have also other constraints and triggers and stuff if you really want to. Um, however, I do not recommend this kind of setup. It is possible, uh, but I do not recommend it. There's, there's very little need to have any other type of index on a, on a well-architected fact table than just the uh, non-cluster column store index. Uh, so, it, But if you look at this table and you go to its properties, what you will find is that um, aside from the, the, the row wise, uh, the column wise storage of this index, the, st the storage of this index is what you might expect. In, in other words, you still have the index represents a separate copy of the table data. So I have my, my table data, you know, uh, 1.7 gigabytes here. Um, and then I have some, some space. Uh, being used by the separate copies of my data known as indexes and so this is would be the aggregate total of all three of my indexes there of 224 megabytes so what this happened what this means is that whenever anything occurs on this table the data and the indexes need to be updated because the indexes need to be kept kept up to date with the table data it also uh, increases your storage requirements because not only are you storing table data but you have to also store and maintain your index data now this is a different now this will be different with your the 2012 the 2014 version the SQL Server 2014 version uh, of you'll now have the ability to create what's called a clustered column store index and there uh, you only have one representation of the data and um, that is the the index the clustered index version which I will show so uh, important distinction there however I, I do want to emphasize um, just to review a little bit the both of these indexes do do um, the column-wise storage of the data and both of them have segment elimination both of which are critical for for uh, good performance in terms of overcoming your throughput limitation so if I run this query and just to review if I run this query and I have in my where in my predicate logic here I have four values and so um, right now the logical reads for for those four values are 166 logical reads and if I so let's say limit the number of predicate values here and this is reviewed from before what will happen is my logical reads will drop dramatically uh, from 160 to 70 so roughly half um, of the data was returned from this. This is a huge savings because remember I'm still having to scan. These are still logical operators, uh, scan logical operators I'm using, but the data I have to scan won't be the entire index or the entire tables. Just a portion of it that relates to my predicate logic will be moved from disk to CPU. And this can be a, a dramatic savings in terms of um, in terms of uh, throughput requirements. So now if we look at the execution plan, what I want to point out, uh, and this is just a review again, but it's important, so I, I want to make sure that it's covered again. So what we have here, if you look at the top, you have a physical operation, a column store index scan, which is, which is good. We want to have scan operators for our data warehouse type uh, workloads. And then if you look at the actual execution mode, you have batch. And so that's, that's all that stuff that I talked about, about the CPU and the, and the caches and all those things come to play with that, that mode. And you only get the batch when you have, um, when you use your, your storage mode there of the, of the column store indexes. So um, that's important to, to know it as well. So that is um, that is the clustered column store index with SQL Server 2012. Now I have uh, downloaded and installed an instance of SQL Server uh, 2014, um, and to give you an idea of, of what the clustered column store index looks like and how that operates. 
So on the screen here, I've pulled up uh, my instance with uh, SQL Server 2014 installed on it. And here I just have a VentureWorks and I have a copy of the fact internet sales data that I've expanded out to make it 100 million rows, uh, just so that it kind of provides a little bit of uh, uh, performance variability under different scenarios, um, given my, my laptop's capabilities here. So. So we, here is the 100 million row fact table. And as you can see, I have a created a clustered column store index. And, um, and the process for doing this is really simple. Uh, because uh, you, with clustered column store index in 2014, you can only have one index on the table. And in fact, there's a really good reason for that. I'll show you in just a few minutes because the the cluster column store index is the table's data. Unlike the previous indexes, all other previous indexes in SQL Server, um, when you convert the table to a clustered column store index uh, in, to, in to SQL 2014, you actually convert the entire table's data from row storage to column storage. Um, and so none of the other indexes would work on the table because they all expect a row row formatted data. Now, now the actual table data is being stored in a column-wise format. Um, and the other part of the cluster column store index, you only have one on the table um, because you're actually physically changing the table's data layout and um, you must include all the columns. So there's, uh, you know, so that makes the create col the cluster column store index statement really simple. Uh, you, you collect it, you collect, you create the the one index, the only index you're allowed to have if you're going to have a column store index on it, and um, you specify the table and then maybe the file group. So uh, that's that's all there is to it. And automatically, all the the uh, rows are included by default in that. All all the columns, excuse me. Um, so there really isn't any anything else. And if you try to you try to break one of these rules, you'll get a nice warning sign like it like the displays up here. Um, so uh, and I'll show you just real quickly again. So now it functions. Here's this the same almost exact same query that I had before. Um, I just have a basic aggregate and um, and I'm I'm just in some predicates and you can see that. In fact, um, if I go to my messages, I have uh, 342 reads, and if I block out about half of my predicate values here, then my my read my uh, logical reads will drop as well. And of course, this all happens with the batch execution mode. Go to my messages, and my logical reads are now dropped dramatically to 86. So um, one really important note here. So getting back to this, even though this is called an index, by creating this index, I have physically changed the way the entire table's data is stored, unlike with the non-cluster column store index. So now, if I look at my 100, row, 100 million row fact table here, that I've used. So I go to my properties. This total space and my index space is zero because my index is my table's data and there's 100 million rows and the total space for my entire fact table, 100 million row fact table, is, um, is 4.3 megabytes. So that is a, a dramatic savings. Um, Whereas if I go to my non-clustered column store index and I go um, to my 100 million row fact table, which is this one, this is the same table just created with a non-clustered -col column store index. And I go to my properties and my storage, you can see that typically this this table, exact same table created the exact same way, that this uh, table uh, size would be 16 gigabytes. So only a few megabytes, five megabytes compared to 16 gigabytes in storage uh, space. So as you can see, the the clustered 
column store index dramatically decreases your space savings while giving you a tremendous in increase in, in performance over traditional row storage uh, indexes and indexing. Um, so also with um, with your clustered column store indexes you can now make updates and I'll go into a little bit more detail in a few minutes about that but you can now make DML operations direct updates on the table with and in case you weren't aware uh, with the traditional uh, with the SQL Server 2012 non clustered column store indexes uh, you cannot make any updates directly to the index to the table once the index is created you must drop the index and make your changes to the table and then recreate the index or use um, uh, something like partition switching or something of that nature to get all that accomplished. So, but that that is not no longer the case with your uh, the new clustered column store index in SQL Server 2014. And now just to kind of emphasize this, the clustered column store index uh, reduces space. We've seen that. It reduces space dramatically because you literally change the way the table's data is stored instead of uh, instead with the the older non-cluster column store index which is just a, um, a copy of data in a column wise format. Um, allows for DML operations and so this goes into the Delta store. I'm not going to go into much detail about the Delta store. Brian Mitchell has an excellent um, presentation on tech ed about that and there's also been other uh, per performance enhance and enhancements to it as well what I will say is that the reason why these um, the reason why the new clustered column store index can accept updates is because behind the scenes there's actually a um, what's called a delta store and I think of a delta store like in because I work a lot with data warehouse workloads and, and partition switching like that I think of it as a, a partition a special partition that still stores data in a row wise format so what happens is as you insert data into your clustered column store index table it isn't inserted directly into the table in most instances. In most instances, it's inserted into this delta store, which comprises anywhere between 120,000 rows to a million rows. You know, and that's the place where the segments, once it's reached um, a million rows, then the segment is created and inserted into your clustered column store index. And so, exactly like that. And so, as data is inserted, one more time into the delta store and once the delta store fills up with its it wants to make those hundred about hundred those million row segments I talked about before once it can make those million row or approximately million row segments depending on the size of your caches um, then it will insert those segments into the new table as so so then you get um, you get to perform DML operations and de deletes, uh, so those are inserts and deletes are, are logical operations done with a bitmap that actually marks these row, uh, these individual rows, if you will, um, with a uh, with a, a delete uh, indicator. And then it's only when you, the index is physically rebuilt do those actual rows disappear. Um, so and then an updates are handled by a, a journaling technique, which is is basically an insert and a delete. Uh, put together. So and and then so the move that that moves the data across again is the tuple, the tuple mover, move, and it all happens uh, automatically behind the scenes. You don't have to configure or do anything about that. Um, again, I, I I highly recommend Brian's uh, presentation here. It's a very good presentation to give you a lot more details. Um, but what I would say is that even with um, Calm Store whether you're likely where you can whether you can get the SQL Server 2014 version the clustered column store index or the non-clustered in SQL Server 2012 both of these are tremendous tools tremendous performance increases but also need the additional thing I would add in before I, I leave this topic is that you still need to consider uh, good 
fact table data management such as uh, partition switching when, and things like that which I'll get into a, a little bit more in subsequent videos so all this standard uh, data modeling uh, dimension fact table that kind of thing and partition switching and, uh, and batch oriented mode processing is still very important um, and critical and you'll get better performance if you have a correctly architected fact table with all those other techniques applied as well and that's kind of the whole purpose of these videos is to give you all the techniques um, all put together to give you an idea of how all these things function to together for data warehouse specific workloads okay and that's all I had for this video thank you for, thank you for your time bye